this story starts as so many other journeys of my life did, on a beautiful, snowy, icy cold day in winter, the day that my darling husband, Ben, he was up here leading worship with Alice, um, broke my rib. There's, you know, no other kind of way to put it. It wasn't an intentional rib breaking, I'd like to clarify, but in, in that moment of fun and frolics in the snow and as the guys started rugby tackling the girls and he rugby tackled me and instead of falling into the deep, soft three feet of snow, I managed to fall on a bank where there were three inches of snow. And so when my body hit the ground and then his body soared through the air and landed on top of me, it was, it was an experience. Uh, you know, the, the, the physical sound of the crunch of my rib breaking will remain with me forever. Um, Yesterday, we had a birthday party for our six-year-old in which Ben dressed up as Stoic the Vast, a Viking from How to Tame Your Dragon. He, uh, he crocheted the beard by himself, in case you were wondering. But he was, yes, yeah, it is deserving of much, much mention. But that moment dramatically altered the course of my life. Because not only did I then have a broken rib, which I sort of hobbled home with, um, realizing that you need your ribs to like smile, breathe, walk, talk, sit, roll. I had no clue the role that my rib played in my life until it was uh, not as it should be. And then I made a decision which I came to regret. And that was that I was going to uh, just see, you know, go home to bed and see how it was in the morning. Well, when I woke up in the night in excruciating pain, went to get a drink of water, dropped the glass, passed out from the pain, sliced my leg open, fell back and uh, split the back of my head open on the stone tiles. I regretted it even more, obviously, at that point. But that began a journey for me. Ben says it was the day he fell in love with me. I had a slightly different experience of that day, obviously. You know, my memories of it are a little more patchy. Uh, but the, the, the concussion and the trauma from that day um, set me on a journey forward. And often I talk about that story in terms of the dramatic healing that God did in me. Because actually I lost my sense of taste and smell in the accident. And that's, that was a big 18-month journey in which God supernaturally healed and restored my sense of taste and smell. Thank you, Jesus. But it also began a journey which I felt God asked me to begin sharing about and prompt me about recently, where the, the following year was, I would describe as the best and worst year of my life. The best because we were falling in love, dating and engagement. The worst because my internal life became like a nonstop version of the biggest roller coaster at Canada's Wonderland. It was like being strapped in one of those things that just never stopped. Because the the PTSD I experienced from the head injury, followed by the sort of anxiety and depression at losing my sense of taste and smell, were quite dramatic. And I had no idea what to do with this sudden crashing down of my internal world. I was a pastor at the School of Ministry at the time, and it was like all these things that had been, that worked and I knew how to do suddenly stopped working. And I felt in a tremendous, tremendous place of weakness, a tremendous place of vulnerability, a tremendous place of need. And I don't know about you, but it is uncomfortable to feel weak. In fact, that is such a dramatic understatement. I I should clarify that. I remember the first time someone talked about Jesus identifies with you in your weakness. Would you stand with him? I was filled with anger. 
Do you know why? Why no, Sarah? Well, let me tell you. Um, I felt angry because it was as though I'd spent my entire life trying to be strong and to build walls and defenses so that I could be safe. And you were telling me to, that I, I should stand in weakness with Jesus. I remember just looking at the guy and being like, that is just ridiculous. However, I have come to see it is a deeply life-giving thing, and I recommend it for all. Yeah, you can laugh. That was supposed to be mildly amusing. So what does it say for you and I? What does it look like for us to say yes to God in the midst of weakness in our lives? I don't know what your journey looks like. It may be that you're waiting on a healing on a promise that God has spoken out, but you're not seeing it yet. Maybe you're in a place like I described where your emotions and your internal life are like a a sort of nightmare version of Canada's wonderland. Maybe it's a little thing. Maybe it's a challenge that you face at work. Maybe it's a life crisis place. But I want to challenge you and invite you this morning, how are you saying yes to God in that place of weakness? You see, Jesus models it for us. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it records the moment of Jesus's baptism. This is the beginning of Jesus's public ministry. And he comes to John, and John is doing a baptism of repentance. What is repentance? This is where you repent for things you have done wrong. I mean, I like to imagine it more like real life. Um, and I'm like, I bet there were people on, the, on the, the banks of the Jordan River like, ooh, I wonder what he did. I can just, oh, I, I think I'm discerning some things. You know, oh, I just can tell it was something really terrible. I mean, obviously gossip, but I, he needs a lot. Maybe they should take him down for a second dunking. Because that's often what people think in their heads. They're like, oh, I wonder about that. And there's this little chit chat. When Jesus walks up to John, John is like, no, you should be baptizing me. So why did Jesus start his ministry with a baptism of repentance? It was because Jesus began by identifying with us in our weakness, in our humanity. He didn't didn't live his life on earth out of his deity, out of his strength and godhood. He lived his life on earth out of his humanity as the son of man. And so as he stood there, Luke 3, 21, 22 records, and as he was praying... Heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son whom I love, with you I am well pleased. When Jesus stood there looking in his spirit towards the next three years of ministry, he wasn't unaware of the things he would face. In fact, I'm pretty sure he saw the shadow of the cross that was to come. And in that moment, as he prays, as he stands with us in our place of weakness, as he stands with us, identifying with us in our need, he shows what happens when we come to our heavenly father and say, here I am. I stand with all those defenses, all my strength stripped away, and I say, here I am, I'm in need. You see, the two things that happened was that, number one, Jesus was empowered by the Holy Spirit for the journey ahead. He was, the Holy Spirit descended on him, and he was given strength He was given courage. He was given grace, authority, anointing, empowering to do the job that the Lord had set in front of him. And I can assure you that when you come to him in weakness and in need, the Holy Spirit will empower you. The Holy Spirit will give you grace and courage and strength for today. The second thing we see 
is that he was found by love. He was found by the love of his heavenly father. I don't know about you, but that was a significant moment. And often at the beginning of something, you see parents, you see coaches, you see mentors, and they're like giving the big, this is like the moment. They're like, Jesus, you can do it. Go for it. Go in the power of the spirit. You will do this well. You know, the father didn't speak to him with the coach voice. Remember what I taught you, Jesus. Remember what I have told you. He didn't speak to him with the teacher voice. He he didn't speak to him with the, son, you better do this well. We've only got one shot at this in angry father uh, voice. But the father revealed who he is as he revealed who Jesus was. He said, this is my beloved son in you. You you are my son whom I love. With you, I am well pleased, full stop, period. In the moment where it mattered the most, in the moment where he was beginning all things, the father found him with love. And when we are found with love, it strengthens us, it encourages us, it gives us life, it grinds, grounds us, it reminds us of who we are. And I don't know about you, but in moments and situations where I faced hard things, when I remember who, who I am, that I am God's beloved daughter and that I am dearly loved, I make way better decisions when I make them out of that place than when I make them out of the anxious running round and round and round in circles place in my head. Jesus' choice to step into Jordan and identify with us was his yes. Will you say yes to inviting God into your place of need and weakness? In that year of the great Canada Wonderland behemoth experience, There were times that I would end up at Gordon and Kathy's house just crying because I couldn't stop crying. And I didn't know what to do because all the things that used to work weren't working anymore. Um, I always say that if Ben could love me after that year, I knew that we could face anything together in marriage because I was just up and down. My emotions were doing all sorts of unusual things. And I felt deeply um, anxious and fearful about being alone, uh, which was a result of the accident and the trauma of the accident. But as an introvert, are, they, are there any introverts out there, people who get need to be alone, to be re-energized? Come on. Come on, we're not a church of like 17 introverts, are we? You are like the rest of you. I'm, I'm terrified. Um, <laughs> But I, I'm refreshed by being alone. I, I just love it. I love people. I just need a bit of both in my life. And so that year, I almost felt like I didn't know who I was anymore. And I'm falling in love, and then I'm freaking out because what if, what if what I'm feeling isn't real because I don't feel like I can trust my emotions and feelings anymore? And so then I'd spiral down. And what if I'm not falling in love and maybe I need to end it and it will be fair? And then I'm like, oh, that would be the worst thing ever. I can't live without him. And so I would just ping pong back day and night. At the same time, I'd come home from work and I, I, I had so little energy. Uh, I, uh, I would often just lie on my bed and listen to healing songs, like songs that talked about healing, because I was like, God, I believe you're going to heal me, but I, I have no strength to pray in some ninja way or contend. I was like, my body and person is present while healing words are being spoken out. And that was about all I could do. And in the midst of that, as I 
chose to be present in that weakness, in that vulnerability. And even in the midst of that, there can be things that you're like, oh, maybe I need to show everybody that I'm doing fine. Maybe I need to hold it together. You know, I've been a Christian a long time. I just need to buckle up and keep moving forward. But I, I was, you know, feeling convicted by the Holy Spirit to choose to present myself before him and be like, I'm in need again. It's an hour since I last was in need, but I'm, I'm here. I need you. And one, there was one day that I was particularly found by love. And it was in about the May time, and I was working, and there was a huge power cut on the Friday morning. All the electricity went out in the whole area, and so I couldn't work because I had a desktop in an internal office. And so I, I came to sit in the back of Chris Vallotton's class. So Chris Vallotton was here from Bethel, a phenomenal prophet. He finished speaking, started prophesying over the students, didn't stop at the students and came to um, us as the staff on the back row. And, you know, he gets to me and he, he pauses and he looks at me and he says, I see you in a wedding dress, at which everybody in the class starts laughing and shouting because they're like, yes, here you are. You are single. You've got the million dollar prophecy. This is your moment, Sarah. <laughs> And he, he said, I see you in a wedding dress. And I don't know if you've just got married or you're just about to get married, but the Lord wants you to know that he sabotaged every single relationship you've had before to save you for this man. I mean, what a word. And everyone's like, woohoo! And I just break down sobbing because in that moment, I was, I wasn't, I didn't hear a nice prophetic word. I was found by love because the cry of my heart had been, Father, I, I can't trust myself. I need to know what to do. And I'd been going back and forth and this anxiety and fear had just been this huge vortex within me. And in that moment, I heard my father say, I love you. I've got you. And the relief and the, the encounter I really had an encounter with God in that moment. Now, it was pretty awesome because everybody in the room immediately felt deeply awkward because they didn't, they thought I just got a fabulous prophetic word, but now they didn't understand why was I crying? Maybe I didn't like Ben. Like, what was this? <laughs> so then everyone's a bit like, oh, oh, ah, uh, okay. Uh, and I'd like to tell you that on that day, all the anxiety, PTSD, you know, trauma-related effects of the ac that accident stopped. But no, they didn't. I still walked that journey out over the next few months to come. But I experienced day after day the grace and the joy of being found by my heavenly Father in a place of weakness. That's what he has for each one of us. I don't know what your journey is, but he wants to come and find you but with love. I wrote that prophetic word down. I listened to it again on the days when I was still crying again and my heart was freaking out. I'd be like, listen, heart, Jesus spoke these words to me through Chris, and I'm going to remind you of them again. And I would just speak that prophetic word out, and I would cling on to it. At times, it felt like my bleeding fingertips. It's not that hard to fall in love with him. He's a really lovable man. It was more me and the great behemoth dropping uh, roller coaster. But I was found, and that love found me and gave me the grace and courage to go forward. In the Old Testament, there's a story of another man who was invited to be baptized in the waters of Jordan, and he nearly missed his encounter. 
He nearly missed his healing because of his anger and his pride and because what God said didn't look like what he thought it would look. Naaman was one of the most powerful men in Syria. He was the commander of the king's army. He was strong. He was capable. He was respected. He was feared. He was wealthy. He was the epitome of strength in his day. And yet he faced the greatest crisis of weakness in his life that he was powerless to do anything about because he had leprosy, a skin disease that caused disfiguring skin stuff to happen on his skin. I'm a medical professional, obviously. (laughs) That was a joke. And the prognosis was increasing disfigurement that would result in infection and ultimately death. He hears from a servant girl that there's a man, there's a prophet in Israel whose God can heal him. And so he goes with his entourage. And in 2 Kings 5, we see him in this crisis moment. He gets to Elisha's house. And he waits at the door and it said, but Elisha sent a messenger out to him with this message. Go and wash yourself seven times in the Jordan River. Then your skin will be restored and you'll be healed of your leprosy. But Naaman became angry and stalked away. I thought he would certainly come out to meet me, he said. I expected him to wave his hand over the leprosy and call on the name of the Lord his God and heal me. Are not the rivers of Damascus, the Abana and the Partha better than any rivers of Israel? Why shouldn't I wash in them and be healed? And he turned and went away in a rage. His answer didn't look like that which he thought. He wasn't met with honor by the prophet. The prophet didn't wave his hand and do things like he expected. The answer was was to go down to a dirty little river, take off his clothes and reveal his vulnerability, reveal his disfigurement, and then wash in this dirty river. His anger, his pride, his desire to hide his weakness almost cost him the miracle. And it was actually the people around him who ran after him and his offer, they tried to reason with him and said, Sir, if the prophet had told you to do something very difficult, would you not have done it? So why not simply obey him when he says, go down and wash and be cured? And so Naaman chose. He went down to the Jordan River and dipped himself seven times as the man of God had instructed him. And his skin became as healthy as that of a young child. And he was healed. My question to you this morning is what would stop you from encounter? Do you need to be strong? Do you need to hold it all together? Do you need to have your miracle look the way you imagine. You know, the healing that God did in me uh, in that 18 months after that accident was not the way I imagined it. I was ready to be laid hands on and boom, shakalaka, be healed in an instant. I was even ready that there was one day I was at a meeting And someone had a word of knowledge about having lost the sense of taste and smell. And they were a bit like, I don't even know if this is a real thing, but I just got this. And I'm like, it's me. Here I am. I'm like, I know about words of knowledge. I know how to engage my faith with the word that's come. This is God. And he prayed for me and nothing happened. (laughs) Nothing outwardly happened. I was snorting people's fruity lip balm and a, has the Lord healed me? You know, it's a better, a better alternative than somebody's BO. Uh, and, uh, and in that moment, disappointment knocked loudly on my door. Well, if, I, if I'm not healed during a word of knowledge, maybe I'll never be healed. Will God really meet me? 
I know God said I'd be healed, but I've, I've done all the things. I've, I've fasted, I've prayed, I've gone up for every healing meeting and call known to mankind. And there's a lot when you're at this church. And nothing happened day after day, week after week, month after month. And then when God did start healing me, it wasn't even in a moment. It was like this incremental journey that felt like it got worse before it got better. However, I just kept pressing in and saying, yes, yes, I trust you. You're my healer. You're my healer. I'm, I'm in need. I'm freaking out because you haven't fully healed me. I'm freaking out because you haven't healed me at all. I'm freaking out because I'm freaking out and I, I need you. My pride, my desire to hold it together could easily have stopped me from living in a place of connection and encounter with God. And so although that was the best and the worst year, it was also such a deeply connected year because I chose to live in the discomfort place of vulnerability and weakness. How many of us here today need to do that too? This last year or so has, has been a moment of me realizing new realms of weakness. Yay. Um, I just love those. Um, three years ago when I left my job with the School of Ministry, I loved my job with a passion. Like it gave me such joy in all the different elements of it. But I knew it was time to go because I had these three gorgeous girls that I wanted to be at home and be present with. And this last summer, God began to speak to me. Can I, can I give, be, be real about how my moment of revelation came? Because when I'm like, I had this revelation and you're probably like, oh yes, she was just praying and hanging out with the Lord so spiritually. Uh, okay, let's give you the real, this is how revelation really comes. It's Friday afternoon, Ben says he's coming home at 5.45. At 5.58, he is not yet home, nor has he yet texted me as to why he's not home. And I had sort of been clinging on with my fingernails to like, he's coming home. 45, only 13 more minutes, 15 more minutes. So when he walks in the door, I am feeling a level 10 frustration and anger. However, I'm self-aware enough to know that I'm having a massive overreaction. Maybe you know of people like this. And I am so angry that he is 13 minutes late and he didn't message me. And I'm so aware that it's such a big overreaction that I'm just like, when he came in, I was like, babe, I need to go upstairs and have time with Jesus. Because if I say anything, I'm going to regret it. Do you ever have those moments where you're just like, in fact, I probably didn't say it as nicely as that, to be honest. I was a bit like, I need to go and be alone, twitch, twitch. Uh, at which point I think he was like, please go, go and be alone with God. And I went up to my room and I'm just like sitting there. I'm like, I just need to be alone. I started actually coloring. I had one of those coloring books. I'm like coloring it. And the main feeling that comes out of my heart is I just... I miss coming home on Friday and having a weekend. And that's not how I feel in life right now. It's just like my life is one big blur of living life as a family. And I'm like, I just want to come home and feel like it's the weekend. And I just start, I burst into tears. I'm like, this is so irrational. It's like, Sarah, what's happening in here? So I stay with it. And as I go down deeper, you know, when it's one of those things and you, you know, it's like when you have a hairball in the drain and the more you pull it up, like it's like as an animal living in there, it's so repulsive. That was what it was like. And as I pulled on my irrational, I'm a level 10 angry that you're 13 minutes late. It became, I'm really sad that I don't get to come home and feel like I've done my job and now it's the weekend, which became, I'm so sad 
that I don't work at the school anymore. And I miss it, and I'm really afraid that I'll never have a job that I love as much. Well, wasn't that a surprise? And as I let myself feel that, I cried and cried and poured out my heart and all sorts of other things, just like that hairball out of the drain, came out. I I had no clue in there. And as I poured that out in vulnerability, in messy vulnerability before the Lord, I just began to encounter the gentle whisper of the Holy Spirit meeting me. And the, 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 the settling, for me, I often feel the love of God in that just this peace that descends on a place that has been like a raging sea. But that day where I allowed myself to sit in the vulnerability of the messiness of my life has changed so many things about the last nine months. Because suddenly, instead of trying to ignore something I've been sad about and missed and have been grieving, and do you know how I ignored it? Busyness. Because it's so busy being the mother of three children. Let's be real. All of us face massive busyness in our lives. And we can all allow that to be an excuse to stop us facing the things that we feel vulnerable, weak, sad about. Let's stop doing it. Let's have the courage to sit down and say, here I am, God. I feel weak, messy, and I don't know what to do about it. And I have experienced day after day, I just feel like there's a huge new grace on my life that has come from that day, the day of the level 10 reaction. Ben came up you know, a while later with like some cheese and crackers on a plate. I think he was attempting to soothe the savage beast that I was at this, that point. And it seemed deeply relieved that I'd had a good encounter with God. So, you know, I recommend it if you ever have those level 10s. This morning, without further ado, I want to invite you, if you're in a place of weakness, if you're in a place of need, let's come forward. Because God wants to encounter you, he wants to empower you, and he wants to find you with love. Let's stand to our feet. And if that's you, if you, if you want to come and stand with Jesus this morning in, in the metaphorical waters of Jordan in your life, I'm going to invite you to come forward to the front. And we're going to take a moment and just pray So Jesus, I come to you in weakness this morning. I come to you in need. And I choose to let go of my defenses. I choose to let go of all my excuses of why I don't need to be vulnerable. And today I invite you to meet me. Meet me in the mess. Meet me in the place where I feel I don't know how to go on. I need you. I need you to strengthen me, to help me, and to find me with your love. I'm just going to release the ministry team to come around and start laying hands on people. But Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, I release an outpouring of the Holy Spirit on these ones as they come and pour their hearts out before you. Would you come upon them in an empowering of the Holy Spirit that is going to give them radical grace and radical strength and radical courage to face today and tomorrow?
what I see as the Holy Spirit comes upon you is that there is a restoration of hope coming to your heart. And if you have experienced hopelessness in the last few weeks and months, why don't you just put your hand on your heart? And I feel right now the Holy Spirit is breathing hope into you. He's breathing hope into you. He's taking off despair. He's taking off that paralyzing anxiety you've experienced. And he is saying, breathe, my child. Breathe because there's hope for tomorrow. There's hope for tomorrow. There's hope for your future. And Father, where where people have been contending for miracles, contending for healing, Lord, would you just release that miracle to them right now, even if it looks different to the way they expect. If you need to go and pick up your children, now's the time to do it. We're just going to stay here for a moment because the Lord is moving. I saw him send in his battle angels this morning um, who, who, who were these angels who I felt the Lord is releasing to contend on your behalf. And, and those of you who felt stuck and who felt like I do not even have the strength to move another foot forward, the Lord has released his battle angels to walk ahead of you and they are warring, they are clearing the air they are holding up your arms where you have felt weak and weary and the Lord's saying I'm not leaving you to fight alone I'm not leaving you alone in this journey but I am with you and I am for you and I am sending my ministering angels to support you and help you and clear the way I just feel like space is being made in the spirit around you where you felt really hemmed in wow And I bless you in the journey right now. I bless you in the place of weakness that you would be encountered by our heavenly daddy's love. Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, would you release an outpouring of your love, an outpouring of the love that finds us, that declares over us in our place of greatest vulnerability and weakness. Not where we're on our A game, but when we're just struggling even to stand, that you declare over us, this is my beloved son. This is my beloved daughter in whom I am well pleased, whom I love, whom I delight in. Let's just breathe in his love right now. Some of you need to pour out your heart to the Lord. You need to tell him of the journey. You need to tell him of the place that you've come to. And he is going to receive your heart and your voice because you're about to, you're about to experience a transition in the spirit as you do that. He is not condemning you for your weakness. He's not condemning you for your journey. He's not angry with you because you've not had enough faith. He's not angry with you because you've not done enough. You've not earned enough. He is filled with compassion for you in this moment. And the compassionate heart of God is wrapping around you and saying, I love you. I'm here with you. I love you love you. Here is grace for today and strength for tomorrow. Thank you, Father. I'm going to release you to head home and I bless you to live a life of connection with God. Don't let busyness steal your miracle.